welcome to a very special evening tonight. No? The hell with it. I'm an actor. I'll project. <laughs> good evening and welcome tonight. Charlie, can you hear me? No. That's no, good. <laughs> Believe me, Charlie, it's going to be better that way. Welcome to a very special evening tonight. I'm not going to take too much time. Uh, we do have one announcement that we do have an oral... We do have an oral interpreter here tonight. If someone is in need of an oral interpreter other than Charlie, if you will let us know here, we will, uh, we will make those arrangements. Uh, I need to mention also, before we get into the rest of the program, that the silent auction is going on in the lobby and will go on until 8 p.m. or so. Fabulous gifts out there, so if you haven't been at the silent auction, please do so. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure at this time to present someone to you that really needs no introduction, a wonderful friend of Charlie's. We're very happy she's here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Joyce Pauley. Mr. Roy Pong. Well, hello, Charlie. We're here to celebrate your 60 years. You're in your prime, Charlie. It's your time, Charlie, to click your heels, review old reels, and laugh through tears. This Caddy, kids are women, what a birthday dinner, with Nancy, Joanne, Robert, and much more, family friends are here to toast you, fireworks flame around to roast you, hang on. Laying plans of what to do From PTF to RAL Friends, that's fun With song and dance So fancy And loving hell from Nancy You found your niche Without a hitch You became our TV star you give us blues, Charlie. News without the blues, friend Charlie. You've been our rock, and still you've been a friend. So, cheers to good times past, and cheers to your birthday blast. Since this is a birthday celebration tonight of sorts, uh, it wouldn't be a birthday celebration without a birthday present, and we start, thought we'd get right to some of the gifts at the very beginning. So if we could, let's bring that uh, gift in. This has come a long way for you, Charlie. <laughs> the logistics problem. Bring it in slowly. Charlie's not supposed to have a lot of big shots. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Gaddy, uh, we might need you here to help.
W-R-E-L. In case you can't recognize them over in the dark, that's from W-R-E-L, Donna Gregory, Greg Fischel, and Tom Souter. Come on up. Thanks, David. I'll be very brief. It is an, indeed an honor and a privilege to sit next to a man of such standing in the community every night. I feel like I share him with you. Charlie, when I am asked to describe him, I tell people he is the most sincere man I know. However, now that Charlie is getting on in years, I think he's becoming a little more... maybe gullible is the right word. <laughs> Charlie, you see, remembers the days when he started at WRIL with you know, his height, his stature, and about a 29, 30-inch waist. Well, Charlie tells me now he hates it when they get that shot from the side. He says, I look over on that camera and I see an old beach whale and I realize it's me. So Charlie, for the last eight months, has been on a reducing diet. And Charlie has bet me that in eight weeks, when I give birth to this child, I will have a bigger waistline than Charlie. And I am so convinced that I will still win this bet. But Charlie, I brought you a gift. It's a tape measure. <laughs> and it stretches. So you can have that 34-inch waist. We love you, Charlie. Happy birthday. Charlie, this box was the only way that I could think to incorporate the present conditions into this. <laughs> now think about it. Come on. Think about it. I was going to say that Charlie's name is synonymous with respect, and it has been suggested by more than one person on our staff that his face should be etched into Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and contrary to popular belief, that is not, as, not because he's stone-faced. All right. One of the frustrating things about, uh, at least for me, being in this business is that people always ask me, what's the most outrageous thing that's ever happened to you? And Charlie, being as respectful as he always is, nothing outrageous had ever happened to us until last fall, actually last summer, leading up to the Senate campaign. Uh, the whole thing started with a tragedy, ironically enough. There was a race car driver that you might remember that was killed on the way back to Charlotte after winning a race. And the television news department decided to do a story about the records of race car drivers and whether or not there had ever been any DWIs involved or something like that. So Charlie accidentally said Harvey Gann instead of Harry Gann in the story. And, of course, I'm never upstairs during the newscast. I'm downstairs preparing for my segment, so I have no idea what's going on. I come upstairs, and he says, Greg, I accidentally said Harvey Gant instead of Harry Gant, and I'm going to make this correction, uh, and then we'll throw it to you to do the weather. So he makes the correction. Naive, old, good-natured Greg thinks that this is just a generic story about race car drivers. There's nothing serious about it at all. So I said, well, who knows, Charlie? Maybe Harvey does some of that in his spare time as well. And right when I say that, this big DWI graphic goes full screen on television. <laughs> and what, what bothers me the most about it is that uh, people from the Helms campaign told me that things really turned around after that newscast. <laughs> and Charlie continues his part-time work for the Republican Party even to this day. <laughs> Anyways, in all seriousness, though, Charlie has been a real friend all the way back to the days when I first got here and was backing up Bob, and I can always remember him showing me how to do things in the newsroom, typing up scripts and that kind of thing that it was not his job to do, and he's always been more of a friend and a father to all of us than simply a co-worker, and we all thank him very much for that and hope it continues for a long time. I've worked with Charlie for 20 years, and... Uh, when I first came to work at WRL in 1971, Charlie was one of the nicest people to me. But when I went there, I'd never heard of Charlie. He worked at WPTF radio then, and um, I was too young to listen to WPTF at that time. <laughs> Although, Mr. Goodman, I do listen to it now. <laughs> but I've become older and more mature. But uh, 
I remember my grandmother said, this Charlie Gaddy, you gotta, you got to meet him. He's just the nicest person, you know. And so I went the first day, you know, I said, oh, Charlie, my grandmother just thinks you're wonderful. And Charlie told me this story that's becoming very true. He says, well, it's a funny thing. As you get older, it used to be when you're younger, everybody's mother and grandmother would say, oh, you're, my daughter thinks you're just wonderful. And as you get older, it's your uh, daughter saying, my mother and grandmother think you're so wonderful. <laughs> And that's happening to me a lot. But, you know, Charlie on the news... <laughs> Charlie on the newscast, you know, he never makes mistakes. He's just, you know, sitting up there next to him just gives you confidence. But there's some things that have happened over the years. And one of the funniest stories is that we used to have an opening to our newscast. It would say, look up for Sky 5. And we'd all sit there in the studio and just kind of go... <laughs> Except for Charlie. We'd say, come on, Charlie. No, this is serious business. We're getting ready for the newscast. I'm not going to do anything like that. One day the opening comes on. Look up for Sky 5. And all of a sudden, Charlie goes. <laughs> and don't you know that's the time the director hits the wrong button. So here's Eastern North Carolina watching Charlie. Look, at, look it up for Sky 5. And Charlie, said, Charlie found out that happened. He says, what are people going to think of me? There goes my credibility. So quietly a memo goes out to all directors. Please, if it looks like Charlie may look up for Sky 5. Don't push the wrong button. <laughs> Another time, Charlie's reading a news story, and Charlie is very unflappable. He's reading this news story. There was a collision today in Garner. Two people were seriously hurt. And Nick Pond, who was our sports director at that time, and Nick kind of always just came to the studio and stomped around, and, you know, he wasn't paying any attention. But he heard this, and he goes up and he puts his arm on, hand, arm, hand on Charlie's shoulder and says, Charlie, how many people were killed? Uh, two, Nick. And then Nick realizes he's on camera, and he goes running off, and Charlie just continues with the newscast. <laughs> of course, Charlie, you remember the time I made you an Atlanta Brave fan in 1982. The Braves had won 13 straight games, and I kept talking about Charlie Gaddy. Uh, Charlie was interested. He said, the Braves win today? I said, yes. Yeah. So I started saying, Charlie, the Braves won again. Charlie's excited over there over the Braves. So one day, Charlie storms into the office, and he says, Tommy, do you have a brochure in here? I said, yeah, a Braves brochure, right here. He says, well, let me have it. I've got to take it back to my office. People are stopping me on the streets and asking me about Dale Murphy and all these people I've never heard of. <laughs> and so I was told not to make Charlie a Braves fan anymore. <laughs> but I will say this about Charlie. It's been a pleasure to work with him all these years. When you're sitting on the set, having him beside you gives you confidence. And Charlie's one of these people who always pulls for you to do your best. And that's something I've always appreciated in him. In a business that is just fraught with so many egos, Charlie's somebody who always gives his credit to other people. He always wants the other reporters to do their best. And when I'm sitting up there with Charlie, I want to do my best because I know that he's doing his best. And I've worked with him for 20 years, and I sure hope I can work another 20 years with him. We're going to try to move. You get a video after, so you get it on the bus right now. I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie and Nancy Gaddy. <laughs> we have a, a, an awful lot of tributes tonight, so we're going to try to move it along as best we can. Mayor Upchurch said, are you still going to be here when this is over, David? <laughs> we hope so. So we're going to move it along, and I'm just going to take a few minutes right now before we begin just to say that I love Charlie Gaddy. I mean, I really love Charlie Gaddy. I first met Charlie in the steam room at the Y. It was very foggy. I, I went in, I didn't realize in, for a few moments that he was in there with Commissioner Graham. But Charlie invited me to sit with him. I didn't know what was going on for a minute. Then I realized it was the Commissioner's cigar. 
But I love Charlie Gaddy. And Nancy, I'm so happy to see you here tonight. <laughs> Charlie does pick out Nancy's clothes. I want you to know. <laughs> when, it, when people say that Charlie cracks a mean whip, he does. <laughs> and we've only just started, Charlie. But enough about his personal life. There's an after party. I'd like to... Stay with me, Nancy. It's going to be fun. First of all, thank you all for being here tonight and for joining Charlie and Nancy and for helping to raise money for a very worthy cause. We thank you for taking the time. We hope it's going to be a lot of fun for you. For Charlie, who cares? <laughs> it's going to suffer. <clears throat> like to start our tributes tonight. Feel sort of like Ralph Ed Edwards up here, saying, Charlie, this is your life. We're going to roll back the clock to a time long ago when your hair was dark. <laughs> I've kidded Charlie a lot. We have a joke, a constant joke, and a Christmas carol every year. I kid him about wearing a hairpiece. It's not true. <laughs> I do love this man, and I'm very happy to, to be up here with him tonight and to be able to tell him that. When I first got to Raleigh, I got wished good luck by a lot of people. Charlie was the only one that ever came to me and said, Bud, I love you. And that meant a lot. And Charlie Getty, I'm happy to stand up on this stage tonight and say I love you too very much. To begin with, our tributes. We'd first like to hear from someone very special, Charlie's sister. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mrs. Joanne Gaddy Grimes. Joanne, come over here in the light, darling. Okay. Oh, yeah, they... Ah, surprises. Joanne. And now we're going to take you back for a few minutes. We talked about Charlie when his hair was dark, and now that Joanne has given us that uh, introduction, we'd like for you to take a look here to the left to our video screen, and we're going to take you back and uh, back down memory lane with Charlie Gaddy, and here's the way some of us remember him, know him, so let's take a look. Carolina. 
Lydia and Charlie Gaddy, welcome to the world, little Charles Jr. A day that would forever change the face of broadcasting in North Carolina. Two years later, the Gaddies moved to this humble home in Fisco, North Carolina. It is here where the young Charles grew up with his sister Joanne and brother Bobby, holding his reporter skills at an early age. It was at dear old Visco High that Charles was really bitten by the broadcasting bug. With experience under his belt, he confidently stepped in front of the mic as a member of the radio club. Upon graduation in 1949, he was off to Guilford College for a double major in history and physical education, laying the groundwork for what would later become a career, laying the ground for what would later be laying the ground for what would later become the career of a lifetime. After college, he answered his country's call to duty, then headed to the nation's capital, flirted with a career in law, and went to work for the United States government. But Charlie's career dial was blocked on a different frequency, and his signal to move came in 1958. He landed a job as a page with the Peacock in D.C., in Washington, D.C., getting himself going in the lowest form of life in the broadcasting food chain. But it was a foot in the door. Then in 1960, North Carolina called him home as an announcer at WPTF Radio in Wally. Soon, he was everybody's neighbor on a popular radio college show. As the legend grew, television came knocking at his door. It soon was clear no one knew North Carolina better, and the rest is broadcasting history. I'm proud to present a legend, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Roy Rogers, Mr. Jimmy D. We would particularly like to thank Jay Richard and Steve for putting together this video montage of, of Charlie. Thank you very much. As you saw on the video, Charlie began in Bisco, North Carolina, and we're going to celebrate that time in Bisco by introducing now a childhood friend of Charlie's, Mrs. Martha Tyson. A lady from Boston was once asked where she spent her vacation. She quickly replied, I don't have to go anywhere. I live here. A similar response could probably have been heard from those of us who grew up in this code. I was never introduced to Charlie Gaddy. He was on the scene when I arrived. I always knew him. Not as the anchor and senior editor for WRAL, but as a friend, a classmate, a fellow church choir member, an excellent roller skater, and whatever else it was that made Bisco such a magic place in which to grow up. An incident which I remember very vividly was one crisp fall afternoon when my good friend Mary Hicks and I ambled home from school. We got right in front of the Methodist minister's home, whom I learned later saw the whole thing. And Mary, with the vigor of a high school cheerleader, suddenly threw up her hands and let all her books fall around both of us as she yelled, Chaz, Chaz, Chaz. It was then that I knew that her crush on Charlie Gaddy was very much alive. <laughs> 
So the next time that you pass on your way to somewhere else through that one stoplight and look around and ask yourself, can anything good come out of here? <laughs> your answer will have to be a warm and positive yes. And his name is Charlie Getty. <laughs> As everyone knows, Charlie's a great dancer. I've heard so many women in town saying, you haven't danced until you dance with uh, Charlie Gaddy. Some of you may remember, too, Charlie is a wonderful singer. And uh, wish you sang a little more there, big guy, sometimes. Mr. Jeff B. Wilson from Bisco is Charlie's first employer and a fellow band member, and we'd like to hear from him now. Jeff B. Wilson. Hi, Charlie. You know, I'm from Bisco as the crossroad of the world, as crossroads of the world. You hear what I said? The crossroads of the world. How about that? Charlie told me that I was going to go to uh, the Lions Club in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. And you, what are you going to tell the people over there? I said, well, I don't know what I'll do. He said, tell them it's the crossroads of the world. And, you, and I did that. You sent me there, you know. And I had a, a bike, a little bike there. And I bet a, somebody that gave me a, a sign, and, and I put it on the front of it. Crossroads of the world. And Charlie, you know, you were a great guy in those days. You started it as far as in Bisco. And you ended up uh, Bisco International Airport. How about that? <laughs> and he said it anyhow. Uh, you know, many things that happened at the Bisco soda shop, where he was job, I believe, and understand his uh, first job. But uh, you know what? He'd make those banana splits, especially the girls. And they make them big, you know. <laughs> and, and you also soda shops, and he would give the uh, Pepsis and and also the Coca Colas, and he did a lot of jobs. See, next door was the motion pictures, Bisco Theater. Wouldn't have but one in town, and uh, he would go over there because he get in free, you see, because he worked over here. And they owned the Firestone store and many things he did. Then one of the things I enjoyed so much that, you know, Charlie loved music. You know, when they had those uh, machines over there and it cost six quarter, six, uh, five cents or six for a quarter. And the man would, and on Wednesday, he would leave those quarters. And you remember, he, especially the girls come in, put the quarters in and get six for a dollar. And he used that music. And he told me one day, he said, you know, he was a trumpet man, by the way. And he said, we're going to have a big band one day, 12 or 15 uh, uh, at the band. And you had 15 today. How about that? And uh, you told me, uh, you know, I used to have that Wade Forest band, you know. And I still had the, well, uh, I was in charge of it. And I had my own books, you know, what they call the books. And I said, well, I... Uh, Maybe we could use the books. And sure enough, we went up at his house. Mom and Daddy would let us have a jam session at, at your home, wasn't it? And uh, you said, well, Joanne, uh, Joanne would be the piano player, and I, you're the drummer, and I'm the trumpet, and I've got a friend that's a, a tenor sax, and we started a little band of our own, didn't we, huh? And you did a great job. You told me that one day we're going to have a beautiful music. And you did. You were in the music on the, on the uh, WPTF radio about 1960. You know, I, I came to Raleigh in, uh, in 48 for Truman right, helping him, you know, and Carr Scott. And then you came, followed in for 60, and, and you helped me all the ways. He helped me as a PR person, and, and I couldn't get my job done without Charlie Getty. You see, I didn't know much myself, and I still don't much. But Charlie always helped me on WPTF and Channel 5. 
and I do appreciate many things that you've done, not only to me, but to people. Now, your family is wonderful to you, your family. Your dad was a lion, and he helped the people of the blind and the hearing, your dad. He was an officer, and I was one, and uh, since you are now there helping yourself, it's Charlie the help about the hearing. And uh, so you see you're following your dad. You see he loved his dad and his mother. In fact, uh, your mother would always get something to eat. You remember? They'd give us little cookies and things after the band. And it is interesting that when people have a band at your house, I couldn't believe that, but they'd let us in, right? His dad was a CPL man and a wonderful person. And also... Bisco International Airport was a big thing on the radio in those days, and Channel 5, I guess now. But you, we love you anyhow, Charlie, and we love you so much. And, and find your wife, too. Thank you. Now we'd like to introduce Charlie's ninth grade teacher from Bisco. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Winna B. Maness, or Maness, is that correct? Maness? Maness? Maness. as I am to speaking in public, I could not resist the temptation to join in the Galley Affair and celebrating Charlie Gaddy's birthday. I was asked to say funny things. I couldn't think of anything funny, but I found something. <laughs> Jeff Wilson, excuse me, but I must correct a mistake you made. When he went to California, he rode on a bike, he had, a, he had on trunks, and a big ribbon across here, and it said, Fatso from Bisco. <laughs> and I know because it came out in the Life magazine. <laughs> Charlie and I come from a small town in the central part of North Carolina called Bisco. And I dare any of you not to know the name of Bisco when we leave here. Now, for years, our claim to fame was the fact that we had the oldest accredited high school in North Carolina. Then came a new addition in our fa in our village that we had a so we had a stoplight installed at our crossroads. Now people began to notice Bisco because they had to obey the stoplight or pay the local policeman. <laughs> now, however, when someone asks where I recently lived and I respond Bisco, the reply is, "Oh yes, that's Charlie Caddy's hometown." So Charlie, you've really put us on the map. Thank you a lot. <laughs> I had the privilege of being Charlie's teacher in the ninth grade. He was a good student and a most special young man with impeccable manners, added to the fact he was always a happy person. I'll share a secret with you if you won't tell anybody. <laughs> I had to work hard to resist the temptation of a teacher's pet for Charlie's charms were irresistible even then. <laughs> Charlie, Bisco and I extend to you the happiest of birthdays with love from all of us. We love you. Thank you. And now from the Guilford College Alumni Association, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles C. Hendricks. It's really wonderful to be asked to come tonight to honor my favorite person, Charlie Getty. 
although I feel a little bit like the mosquito at the noodles colony. <laughs> I know what to do, but I don't know where to start. I didn't tell that to be funny, I'm sorry. Uh, but especially when I only have one minute to do it in. I could tell a lot of stories about Charlie Getty and his college days at Guilford, but there's at least one that I want to relate to you. First time I saw Charlie Getty, he walked into the Guilford College dining hall with Vernon Tyson. At that time, I was in charge of the uh, waiters and waitresses in the dining hall. Charlie told me he had a financial problem and wanted to make some money. He was just a l poor little boy from Bisco, and I felt sorry for him and gave him a job. Charlie had two problems. One, getting to work on time, and two, sticking to his job. <laughs> All the girls in the dining hall made eyes at him, and he had to stop and talk to each one of them. He was young handsome, blonde freshman, and the girl would not let him alone. After a few counseling sessions with him, he improved some, but still never got there on time. <laughs> I do not understand how he has been so successful as a newscaster when the most important thing besides the news is being on time. Charlie graduated from Guilford on June the 1st, 1953, with a major in physical education. He did his student teaching and received a teaching certificate to teach in North Carolina. I'm not sure he ever used, never taught a, a day in his life. And I'm not sure that major in physical education was a background for his job. <laughs> but I do know one thing, that graduating from one of the best small liberal arts countries in the nation in liberal arts, prepared him for what he did. After three, about three weeks before graduation, Charlie came to me and said, Charlie, will you loan me a hundred dollars? Of course, Charlie, that would be a thousand now. <laughs> and he said he needs some money for commencement and graduation. About several years after he started to work, he paid the hundred dollars back without interest. <laughs> it would not have made any difference if he hadn't have paid it back because it was well invested. Since he graduated from Guilford, he's been a very important part of Guilford College. Board of the Visitors and President Alumni Association demonstrating his leadership with enthusiasm that made the rest of us want to work. In addition to his time, he has given his support to the institution with membership in the President's Club, which is a central part of our development program, as well as an ongoing support through the loyalty fund and the Quest campaign. Charlie has received a number of honors in his life, but he is basically the same person he was when he was a freshman at Guilford. His head has never been turned. He is still a small town boy at heart. For all this achievement, and I feel like I've had a small part in helping him on the road. It reminds me a little bit of the woodpecker. And you know, a woodpecker is a bird that's not like any other bird. It doesn't walk like one, doesn't sing like one, and doesn't peck like one. <laughs> and he was at the top of a tree, pecking away one day, and along came a puff of wind and blew the tree over. And he said, look what I did. <laughs> So I can say, Charlie, look what I did. <laughs> I took you as a little boy from Bisco and helped make you into one of the most outstanding citizens of North Carolina. <laughs> Charlie, we honor you, and I'm happy to be able to call you my very best friend. Congratulations. Now it's my pleasure to introduce a Guilford College classmate of Charlie's, 
left Guilford College and went a long way, all the way to the United States Congress. My honor to present to you Representative J. Howard Coble. Thank you. Fifteen to twenty years ago at an alumni day reunion on the campus of Guilford College, Vernon Tyson, as my late grandma would say, put up a good prayer. Vernon Tyson offered an invocation that day, and in that prayer he thanked God for having permitted us to see the past come alive again. The past is coming alive again tonight. I could tell you many stories, as could all of you. I'll share this one with you. About ten years ago, when I was a member of the North Carolina General Assembly, I was told that I wanted was to appear in the Channel 5 studios at 6 o'clock for an interview with a Channel 2 reporter. At that time, Channel 5 in Raleigh and Channel 2 in Greensboro had some sort of reciprocal agreement, which I guess is still intact, Charlie. And I did as I was directed to do. And when I first walked into the room, the first face I saw was Charlie Gaddy at the far end. He raised his hand to me, and I responded. And he shouted out, I think you said, Guilford College, class of 53. No need to disguise that. We all know how old we are. Uh, I guess the only problem is you all are wondering why he looks so youthful and I look so decrepit. <laughs> I can't square that one. But anyway, I had went with my interview. He conducted his daily 6 o'clock news presentation. And two or three days later, I received a letter from him. And in that letter, Charlie wrote that he thought as he was undergoing his presentation that at the time of our interviews, my interview and his newscast, he said he thought that we were talking simultaneously to an excess of four million North Carolinians. When I read that letter, my mind reverted to that great old Guilford College campus. Uh, I recall those days, and incidentally, Charlie Hendricks just touched on, of all the friends I have, I guess my Guilford friends are the most special. But I recall those days when on that campus, generously laden with oaks, where we affectionately called him Tex. He was known as Tex Gaddy in those days. And then Tex, I nostalgically progressed along life's course where you and I have been together several times since that, those days. I am pleased and proud to call you a good dear friend. I am honored that you would invite me, your sponsoring group, to share with you and Nancy this very special evening. And now it is my pleasure to present the president of Guilford College, Dr. William R. Rogers. No, I wasn't president of Guilford College when Charlie was there. <laughs> sort of glad I wasn't. He'd probably ask me for $200. I pay interest now. Is that right? <laughs> Charlie, you and Nancy have made a real difference in our lives. And I want you to know that I regard you as a man of uh, peculiar interest and compassion for people, coupled with a sense of fun and vitality in your own life. And the way in which you reach out to other people is very inspiring. I first met Charlie and Nancy at an alumni gathering, alumni dance, at Guilford College in the old gym after I came there about 12 years ago. And as I recall, we spent a lot of time talking. We, we talked about some of the travels you'd been on, and particularly a trip you were contemplating to Africa at that time. And I was amazed at the uh, depth of understanding, the sense of uh, grace and compassion and caring that you had for the people and the struggles that were going on in Africa. And it was a pretty serious conversation. I thought, 
we have a friend here who's a, a real caring person and a deeply thoughtful person. Then I discovered the real Charlie Gaddy. <laughs> Halfway through the evening, the band started to play, and Charlie got a little jittery, and he and Nancy got out onto that floor, and so did my wife, Bev, and me. And I swear, we had to pay the band extra that night because they played well beyond midnight when their contract expired. We were the last four people there, I think. I'm uh, warning the people in charge of tonight's program, you may have a big bill to cover. We'll probably dance till four in the morning. Charlie and Nancy, we love you and we're proud of you. Get a little confused about the presidents of Guilford College. I used to date a girl from Guilford College when I was a student at the School of the Arts. I tried to dodge them. <laughs> was, of course, before I met Charlie. <laughs> it is my pleasure now to introduce to you via videotape at least one person that needs no introduction, you see them often, some others who may, but you'll learn about them. They're associates at WRC, NBC, Washington, D.C. By videotape, Charlie, Mr. Willard Scott, Mr. Ed Walker, and Mr. Laverne Kittens. Oh, there you go. Hey, this is great, because we've known, uh, I can't believe. Oh, Charlie. Charlie Getty. Who was, uh, is he related to Getty all the time? Yeah, I think so, but he was... Is it Getty? Charlie Getty. Getty. Oh, Getty. Oh, Getty. Getty. It's Getty. He was a page Getty. here, and he yeah. went with a girl in the office named Nancy hey, well, Rankin. 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 She had a lot of guys that she dated. In yeah. fact, it was known as the rank and file. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you get out of the oh. car? Hey, we just want to wish you the greatest in the world. You remember Charlie, Charlie the Laverne. Charlie as, Getty. That's we said that. His wife, yeah. Nancy Rankin. We yeah. said that. Charlie, we've all worked with Charlie. Charlie back when? It, was it the Wardman Park or where was it? Uh, no, Nancy was in the Charlie Park. What did Charlie do? I never did. He came him. up from North Carolina. What did he do? He was a painter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did he? Was he ever a big? I mean, was he a star? No, 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 no. Nothing. No. Barely even knew he was here. Yes, right. So you walk up on. <laughs> That's why he went back to North Carolina. Know what he do? What he did? See. Well, we got it. We got to make that. And he's hitting the big six zero. He's in the bottle, I hear yeah. too. I don't. <laughs> It's a 60 years of Charlie yeah. Getty. Let's give him a little philosophy. You hold the mic, Ed. Oh, okay. We have something for Charlie. You're pretty hard. Would you help Charlie. me, Laverne, hold this thing? Charlie, this is for you. And he's done so much on the, on the air for all these years, but this is for you, Charlie. And our, our philosophy here is this, isn't it, Eddie? Yes. Yes. If you were a fish, you wouldn't have gotten caught if you had kept your mouth shut. No, wait a minute. No, I did it wrong. <laughs> you went well at rehearsal. Even a fish wouldn't get caught if it kept its mouth shut, right? I wish that I teamed up with you instead of him, you know what? Good night, Charlie. Whatever you want. <laughs> now also by videotape. Another associate at WRC, NBC, DC, Mr. Mac McGarry. Hey, Charlie, it's your old friend Mac McGarry at NBC in Washington. Happy birthday. You're only a kid. I feel partly responsible for your getting the honor today. I remember you were the vacation relief announcer here in 1960, and summer was closing down. You were wondering where the road would take you next. There was an ad in Broadcasting Magazine then. I remember pointing it out to you. WPTF, We Protect the Family, in Raleigh, was looking for a full-time announcer, preferably one who was a North Carolina native, and said, Charlie, man, this is for you. The pride of Bisco, when they hear those Carolina tones, the job is yours. They did, and it was. The only thing I regret is that you also took beautiful Nancy down there with you. Congratulations on your work with the Cube Speech Center. Happy birthday and love to Nancy from your old friends at WRC-TV and NBC.
An associate of Charlie at WPTF Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wally Osley. I'm going to talk close to this because having been in the back of the room, we couldn't hear everything. Wow, what a night! While I was sitting back there, listening to all those wonderful, glowing, charming things about you, Charlie, I had to muster up all the emotions and self-control I have to keep from believing they're true. I, they told me I had 60 seconds. And you know I have never written anything in my life. I just wing it, right? But tonight I had to write it. And since Jeff Wilson took 10 minutes already, I think I'm done. But I did write down my remarks, Charlie, so I make sure that I said some of the things I wanted to say. Charlie and I go back to the 1960 that you've heard referred to so many times here. We were teammates at WPTF. But with all apologies to Congressman Howard, Charlie came here from Washington, D.C. And like most folks eventually find out when they come here from Washington, D.C., folks don't trust them. They won't have anything to do with them. And people wouldn't pay any attention to Charlie. They wouldn't even talk to him. So that's when Charlie went out and invented Ask Your Neighbor. So people would have to talk to him. So he talked to people all over the state of North Carolina. And they called in and they chatted over the fences. And it became one of the most popular shows, I guess, in radio in the state of North Carolina. Twelve ladies in church this morning told me that they could not get through the day without using the Charlie Gaddy Ask Your Neighbor cookbook. Remember that one? Matter of fact, it's the second thing I open up every morning myself. And also, <laughs> one other thing that I want to mention, the Bisco International Airport's been mentioned here. I want to also remind you of one thing that we did. Nancy, you'll remember this. Somewhere back in the middle 60s, you know, I, I mentioned the fact that people were having uh, trouble accepting Charlie coming back from after being in D.C. And it seemed like even the Almighty was working against folks accepting you. Nancy and Charlie and my wife and I, we're going to fly down, and, and I'm a pilot, so I wouldn't try, dare put him in the plane unless I was. And so we went to this famous Bisco International Airport to visit with Charlie's mother, a lady I really loved. And as we were about to land, the wind started blowing so hard, I couldn't get the airplane to go down on the runway. As a matter of fact, Bob waved at us as we went by the first time. Remember that, Bob? We finally landed. And to relate a happy story, we had a wonderful visit at that crossroads of the world, Bisco. I want to remind you of one thing, Charlie. I'm very proud of you. I am, for what you've done professionally, for the things you've accomplished, for the countless contributions you've made as a wonderful human being, and most of all, I shall be eternally grateful for having you as my friend. And... May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. We love you, Charlie. She's entertained you already tonight. She needs no introduction. But she is a former musical associate of Mr. Gaddy's. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Joyce Hawley Lindsay. Happy birthday, Charlie. It's great to be a part of this day. You know, we go back so many years, and uh, it's wonderful to be a part of the celebration. First of all, uh, I've forgotten how old you are. And this is a relief. I thought I'd called up with you, and you're still a little bit ahead of me. Uh, because, you see, uh, years ago, uh, when I first met Charlie, in fact, I sort of lost track of how many years it was. And... Uh, 
Jim Goodman and I were talking a while ago, and he reminded me of of a, a fun variety show that we did. In fact, Jim, I had forgotten about the uh, local variety show that I did with Charlie. He reminded me of the curtains moving in that variety show when you and I were singing If I Were a Carpenter, and I'd forgotten all about that, too. Years ago, I was a housewife in, in Panther Branch, North Carolina, which is, for those of you that don't know, right outside of, of Raleigh, outside of Garner. And like a lot of housewives, I had uh, joined a ladies' barbershop group, the local chapter of the Sweet Adelines, just to get out of the house and have a little bit of fun. And about 56 women that blended their voice and sung. One Tuesday night, well, every Tuesday night we met at Channel 5. They were kind enough to let us rehearse over there. And when I got there that night, it was a a scurry of activity and all of the women were all excited, Nancy. I mean, Charlie Gaddy was coming to see us. They informed us that Charlie was looking for a voice, a female voice to blend with his, I think to take the place of Joanne, his sister, when she couldn't perform with him. And Charlie Gaddy walked among the 56 women and he singled me out to sing with him. Charlie, that changed my life forevermore. First of all, immediately you lost me 50, 55 girlfriends. I want you to know that. <laughs> then Charlie asked me to, uh, he was kind enough to ask me occasionally to uh, sing with him on his Good Morning Charlie show. And if I'm not mistaken, this was 6.30 in the morning. So once a week, I would, uh, I'd sew like crazy and make myself a new polyester dress. And I would show up about six o'clock in the morning and you and wonderful musician Mr. Paul Montgomery would scurry around trying to help me find a song that I knew enough of the words and enough of the melody to sing that morning. We would rehearse it maybe once or twice and live television. Nobody told me I shouldn't do that even then. I'd be scared to do that now but that was fun. It started my career started our fun years together. In fact, I've been trying to remember, were we the Longmeadow family or the Pine State family? We were the Longmeadow family for two years. You were the daddy. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, we did a variety shows, and that shows you we were limited on variety shows around here. But it was a lot of fun. My most fun memories are uh, some of the shows that we did where every year, it's hard to believe this now, but every year, in fact, Mr. Fred Fletcher was kind enough to include me in the WRAL family. And in the fall, about eight or ten of us, Lynn Level and, and I think Ray was probably a part of it, we would pile into three or four cars and head out for eastern North Carolina. And you and I were the song and dance team. Fred was the MC and local comedian. Paul Montgomery was the musical arranger, and I think the projectionist was our drummer, if I'm not mistaken. And we would entertain JC groups all over North Carolina. And uh, for listening to us, they got to see the fall preview show. Now, I call that PR work, if ever I've heard of it. We had a lot of fun in those days. And in fact, we did a lot of medleys. And if you look right over here, your friend, Mr. Roy Palmer, who is wonderful. Now, I told you a while ago, Charlie, that whatever I do, I want you to remember, payback is hell. And I remember you doing a lot of things, telling me, Joyce, let's go for it. And I wasn't prepared. And I know you are a perfectionist, but tonight, you've got a room full of family and friends. You're going to have to just let your guard down a little bit, Charlie. We have our old medley up here. Roy... Roy, Roy has blown the words up, Charlie, where you and I can both read them. Yes, you can, Charlie Gaddy. And, and I want you to know, when you, when you say, I can't do it, you remember, Roy and I were talking about this, that uh, 21 years later, we are still working for the same fee scale that we did 21 years ago. Our price has not gone up. We are still singing for our supper. But I can't tell you how relieved I am that it's not barbecue. <laughs> you got it, Charlie. 
beneath the candle glow. night and got that old feeling when you came inside I got that old feeling embrace me my sweet embrace just do. I don't know why you thrill me like you do. I don't know why you just do. I'm in the mood for love. <laughs> Simply because you're This is one you had to teach me. Each time I see a crowd of people, just like a fool, I stop and stare. It's really not the proper thing to do, but maybe you I harmonize with you later on. Yeah, Roy. It's been a long, long time. I haven't felt like this, my business can't remember when. It's been a long, long time. You'll never know how many dreams I dream about you. Or just how empty they all seem without you So kiss me once and kiss me twice and kiss me once again It's been a long, long time It's been a long, long time <laughs> Oh, that was fun. That was wonderful. I mean, that's a real treat, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie doesn't sing anymore except in the shower. I know. Talk about needing no introduction. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, the president and CEO of Capital Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, right here, Mr. James F. Goodman. I, um, I can't believe what I just saw. Um, that was great. Look, I'm not um, stupid, you understand. I'm, Capital Broadcasting is now in the baseball business, so I like to use uh, baseball talk. This, this is the Reggie Jackson of the franchise, um, the Steve Avery, the Ron Gant. I'm not going to say anything but nice things about the, about the uh, cleanup hitter. Um, now I was very interested, though, to hear that uh, Tom Suter's changed his feelings about you, Charlie, weren't you? <laughs> I thought that was really, I, I was, <laughs> I was uh, really, and I want to thank um, the cute speech people for having this event. I actually would like for you to do this again. Do you, the next year, do you realize that Charlie Gaddy actually did five newscasts last week? 
think about it. This guy has more vacation than Johnny Carson. <laughs> Doesn't he? Well, I wonder who's going to be on the night. Hello, Fred, where's Charlie? Well, he's on vacation, Jim. I don't do the contract anymore. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's the problem. Now, here's the true story. You hear it, you'll hear it right now. This is what happened. Uh, I was sitting in my office, this was, I'm 1970, 1969, 1970, the phone rang and the voice said, can you come over? That was my grandfather, the chairman of the company, and when he says that, you daggone right you get over there. I was over there in two or three minutes and he said, Margaret, my grandfather's wife, Margaret Fletcher, Margaret loves this program, Ask Your Neighbor on WPTF Radio. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> good. I'm, now, you understand, here I am, the new program operations director, program manager, and I want to put in research and testing. I want everything to be just right. We're really, the station's really going, and I want to test everything and do all this stuff that you're supposed to do. I said, well, I know that's a good show. I've heard it myself. That's very good. And he said, well, how would you feel about putting Ask Your Neighbor on television? I said, um, well... You mean you want somebody sitting there answering the phone on television? <laughs> he said yes, and I, well, I pulled out and I said, well, I think I better research this. Let me do some research on this and I'll get back to you. And he had a way of sort of looking over his eyes at you. He said, I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> Please get in touch with him. Well, there started uh, two or three months later. Um, good morning, Charlie. Um, and I always remind Margaret Fletcher and, and uh, thank her for that. Um, and th there just a, a long pro progression of different uh, roles Charlie's had for the company. As a matter of fact, in thinking about it today, Charlie, I got to feeling bad about it. I, I remember the first year or two, Charlie was doing the morning show on radio. He was traveling with the Duke team. He was doing Good Morning Charlie. He was doing the news. I don't really don't know how we did all that. Um, but Charlie and I started our our trip at WRL about the same time I ride and I tell I don't I can't think of anybody I'd rather ride with it's been a great great ride and you know we love you and appreciate you, everything you're doing if you retire pal you're in trouble don't do it <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday. One other thing, Ray Wilkinson is next. We're going to do a little something here. Uh, Cecil said to Leonard, <laughs> Leonard, look at that lady over there with one eye. Leonard said, gosh, I don't see her anywhere. <laughs> now, see, anybody can do that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> <laughs> A lot of what you hear up here tonight is going to be lies, so let's be real honest. And uh, I know that's a fact because I spoke to Ray before we went on. I said, Ray, you know you only got one minute. Ray said, sure, no problem. <laughs> no, that's a lie. It is my pleasure to present the Vice President and General Manager of the Tobacco Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ray Wilkinson. Thank you, Nancy, Charlie. It's a real pleasure to be here. You know, when we both started in this business, Charlie, in order to have a license for a radio station or a television station, you had to pledge yourself to the public interest necessity and convenience of the public. In order to get a license, you don't have to anymore. That's been eliminated. But Charlie pledged himself to this service to the community back then and has maintained that responsibility to today, and it makes me proud to be a part of the same business, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> Charlie started in the morning with Good Morning Charlie. He's gone on to become famous in the evening news. I'm still working mornings. <laughs> How do you do it, Charlie? <laughs> I get to work on time, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Say nice things to Jim. Uh, 
Charlie gave me a great story that I've told several times, and I'll tell it again here this evening. It's about Arfu McGaskill. Arfu, uh, just to show you the cut of the man, rode a mule through the third shift in the cotton mill in Bisco. You may not think that's anything, but if you ever worked in a cotton mill or rode a mule, you can you tell it's important. The rescue squad and volunteer fire department in Bisco was attacked by a rescue net salesman who was traveling throughout the southeast selling rescue nets to rescue squads. And they bought one. They had uh, ice cream socials, barbecues, raised money and bought the rescue net. During the rescue net day parade when they got the high school band from Sanford, as the rescue squad walked by holding the net as the band played, the head of the rescue squad turned to the mayor of Bisco and said, I just thought of something. We ain't got no two-story buildings in Bisco. <laughs> They couldn't test the net. But Arfu stepped forward. He said he'd jump off a barn, <laughs> which he did. But the rescue squad never had the experience of a human being jumping into a net. And when Arfu hit it, they let go. He broke both his legs and both his arms. But very seldom do we recognize the contribution that people make in life. My final thought is this. <laughs> Cecil and Leonard were watching the 11 o'clock news. <laughs> and there's Charlie. And there's a fella threatening to jump off a building. And Cecil said, Leonard, I'll bet you $20 that fella jumps. Leonard said, I'll bet you $20 he don't. Well, subsequently, the fella jumped. Cecil said, Leonard, you are so stupid. Didn't you watch the 6 o'clock news? <laughs> Cecil. Cecil said, yes, I did. And he said, didn't he, didn't he jump then? He said, yeah, but I didn't think he's dumb enough to do it twice. <laughs> I don't think Charlie's dumb enough to do the morning shows anymore either. <laughs> Charlie, we love you. It's a pleasure working with you. I'm proud to be in the business with you. We got a bit of a change on the program tonight. Been approached by a gentleman backstage who says, "Just run me on. I want 15 seconds." We're going to give it to him because it's Charlie's brother, Bob Gaddy. Uh, the reason I didn't want to come on is I didn't want Jim Gumbin to fire you and hire me. You know, <laughs> at your age, you know. <laughs> I do want to tell you a story. Living in Bisco, you know, didn't know a whole lot. And went to Washington to see my brother. He was going to show me a big time in Washington. I'm not going to cut any ice with him, Charlie. He's scared of what I'm going to say. <laughs> so we went to this bar. First of all, we put on suits. I had to borrow his suit. We put on suits. We didn't have any underpants. He didn't have any clean. <laughs> True. Didn't have any clean. So here we go downtown and go in a department store in suits now and ties and said, we would like to buy some underwear. <laughs> the man said, certainly, that'll be fine. Gentlemen, come on in. So, true story, we go in and get our underwear. <laughs> said, can we borrow the dressing room and go back here and put our underwear on? And come back out. Uh, our mother has always told us to wear clean underwear. <laughs> and this is one of the things she said when we left the house. So after then, you know, I said, oh boy, Washington, D.C. with my big brother, my older brother, and he's going to teach me the ropes. Being from Bisco, I'd never seen a street walker. We didn't have street walkers in Bisco. We walked the railroad track. We didn't know what that was. <laughs> So we went to the bar, and Charles was kind of, you know, he was doing his little thing, you know, showing his little brother a good time. And there were a lady at the bar when we walked in. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Vernon 
he's a good minister. He loves me, but he's got to listen to this. It was unbelievable, Bernie. <laughs> unbelievable. And I thought, oh, here I am. And Charles is going to take care of me. This lady looked right straight at Charles and said, I'll do anything that you want me to do for $200, but you got to tell me in three words. I said, boy, this is it. This is it. My brother walks up to her and says, here's your $200. Mow my lawn. <laughs> Thank you. I love him. Gosh, that's so interesting. <laughs> Charlie took me a, to a bar in Washington, too. I was the lady that mowed his lawn. <laughs> I love this next guy. When he was on, former weather anchor at WRL TV, we all loved him. This guy was incredible. I don't know about the weather. I know he played golf. I used to love to watch. Tornado came through Raleigh not long ago. Charlie was on. He said, oh, Bob, how's the uh, tornado damage? Bob went, <laughs> 12,000 people died, Charlie, but I hit a great game of golf today. <laughs> of course, I'm speaking of no other than the inimitable. Mr. Bob DeBardleben, who would be here tonight except he is on the golf course. So we have him on video. Charlie, here's Bob DeBardleben. Now, uh, we're, we're taping this for whom? Charles Gaddy. Charles Gaddy. Uh, oh, Charles Gaddy, yes, the very successful real estate agent in the Triangle area. In fact, I know him well. I, I bought my first house from him. And, no, 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 Bob. Charlie Gaddy. Charlie Gaddy. You mean, oh, the old white-haired newsman, the straight man for Tom Suter and Greg Fischel. <laughs> oh, I know him well. Charlie, I do know you well. You know, we've, we've sat at this new desk for, for many years. We, uh, we've seen a lot of changes. Uh, we've had a lot of laughs. Uh, we, we might even shed a few tears along the way. I'm sorry I can't be with you this weekend to wish you a happy birthday. I'm down at the Ball-Headed Men of America Convention at Atlantic Beach. Uh, I think you can understand why. I want to wish you a happy birthday. I want to wish you well. I also urge you, don't wait too late to retire. I've been off two years, and it's a blast. And I hope you'll look forward to it, too. I'll see you on the fishing pond soon. Take care, John. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, the former chair of the Cued Speech Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to present to you Mr. George E. Bevel. Charlie, Nancy, Charlie, I had a half a glass of wine, so I might tell anything. I would have had a full glass, but they spilled a half of it on the table. He said I couldn't have any more. That was my share. A little bit just came in from Briscoe that I hadn't intended to tell, Charlie, but I'm going to tell it. At four years old, now this is before my time, Charlie's a lot older than I am. At four years old, the kindergarten director said, Charles, why did you kick little Wilbur in the stomach? Quick, he turned around. That's why I kicked him. <laughs> and... Some time ago, Nancy, this was back in the dark days. Charlie, you and Nancy taught ballroom dancing as well as I can remember. Uh, 30 years ago, about when I came to Raleigh, my wife and I enrolled for two sessions, enjoyed it very much, enrolled for the third session and it was then that Charlie said something real ugly about me. He said, Nancy, 
Don't take George's money anymore. That fellow will never learn to dance. He has two left feet. <laughs> well, Nancy said he didn't say that. Well, somebody said there would be some lies told you tonight, didn't they? But at any rate, uh, I'm good at carrying a grudge. Twenty some odd years later, I was chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Cute Speech Center, and there was a vacancy on the board. We had thought about Charlie and talked to Charlie. Remember, I'm good at carrying a grudge. So I appeared at Charlie's office one day with a lady wearing a big smile and a briefcase. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say that was all she was wearing. But she was wearing that. Went into Charlie's office. I sat there and gleefully watched Charlie's resistance just crumble. Crumble away. Charlie became a member of the board of the Cute Speech Center. Why? Because he couldn't say no to a pretty woman. Charlie, I love you. Sorry I had to tell Nancy about this. <laughs> I would like to introduce at this time the Assistant Director of Education Services for the North Carolina Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. H.G. Royal, Jr. It was in 1971, and I was a superintendent of the Central North Carolina School for the Deaf in temporary facilities here in Raleigh. I thought Charlie Getty was 60 years old at that time. <laughs> I think Charlie will tell you that I was probably one of the first people who uh, talked to him about the needs of the deaf and uh, deaf children in North Carolina. <clears throat> and I could tell you about the time when he came to our school and uh, won the annual turkey shoot contest and refused to share with the administration or with the children. Uh, I even wrote a letter to Mr. Fletcher about his uh, con conduct on the school premises. And, but I, I think he probably got out of the doghouse that Thanksgiving, if I'm right. Nancy, do you remember that year he brought a turkey home? Uh, is that what you told her? Oh, so, um, he is very sneaky. You have to uh, you have to wonder how he got to Mrs. Manis and got her to say those nice things about him before the the uh, meeting tonight. We spent many hours together, and uh, that first year, Charlie put a very informative special together for WRAL TV. It's unfortunate that uh, he has not retained that information. Educating Charlie has not been an easy task. He's, uh, he's lost a lot of his skill in American Sign Language. Uh, he's changed the traditional how are you all tonight in American Sign Language to uh, cute speech to how are you all tonight. I just don't understand him anymore. But seriously, and uh, all kidding aside, Charlie, out of all the people I've ever known, you are certainly one of them. And if it was, <laughs> and if it was, if, if it wasn't for I or David Wood, I would tell you I loved you too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Charlie's done a lot of good work over the past, not the least of which is his work with the cerebral palsy telethons. 
Charlie, let's go back and see an old friend of yours who knows and loves you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, via videotape, Mr. Dennis James. Since I had to stay at home, I thought that I would write a poem. I've known Charlie for many years, and he's really respected by all his peers. We work together for UCP, and we suited each other to a team. So whether it's cerebral palsy or cute speech, Charlie Gaddy, you're a peach. Now it's patch, patch, patch when you turn 60, but the later years can be really nifty. In Social Security and Medicare, you may even lose your hair, but you will find peace of mind without a worry of any kind. You can work charities the rest of your days and help so many in so many ways. Now, I know that this was supposed to be a roast, but I'd rather make it a toast. To pay respect to a talented guy who volunteers and never asks why. Even the children who cannot hear always know when Charlie's near, because his warmth and charm are always felt. The look in his eye can make young hearts melt. I know, because I'm 74 and I call him Daddy. So happy birthday, Charlie Gaddy. <laughs> Also, someone else who comes into our living rooms every Sunday morning. He's the correspondent and host, CBS News, Sunday morning. It is my pleasure, Charlie, to bring to you, via videotape, Mr. Charles Corralt. Charlie Getty is a household name from east to west, from pine tops in the east clear to snow camp in the west. He is as much a part of North Carolina as our tobacco fields. And we don't have to subsidize him. WRAL does it for us. I notice uh, Charlie hasn't been heard from yet tonight. Uh, some words of Jerome Kern come to mind. He don't say nothing. He must know something. But old man Gaddy, he keeps on rolling along. And long may he roll. Charlie's work has taken him many places. One of the places that he's visited, brought us news from, is the People's Republic of China. Here, by a videotape again, is a fellow traveler tr on your trip to China, Mr. Bill Douglas. Charlie, I would need the whole evening to describe all the wonderful and challenging things that happened to us as we explored China together, and in the process formed a friendship that I will always cherish. But one incident stands out and exemplifies your extraordinary ability to touch people's lives even across vast barriers of language and culture. We had just come off the Jean River after our five-day float trip through the wilderness and were making an unscheduled stop in a village of Oronoks, one of China's few remaining tribal cultures. We were assigned to spend the night in the house of one of the village elders, a man who had been a nomadic hunter living in a tent in the forest for most of his life. Through our interpreter, you laughed and chatted with him for quite a while, and then he excused himself. He returned with his two most prized possessions, a piece of pumice stone that he had found in the woods, which floated on water, and a pair of deer antlers in velvet. He became quite emotional, and with a hunter's pride handed you the antlers, asking you to take them back to America as a symbol that we are all just people on this planet, and we should live in peace. He abruptly turned and left the house, his house, and we never saw him again. Thanks, Charlie, for being you. And now in person, Charlie, another fellow traveler on your trip to China, Mr. Tom Earnhardt. I was also on the trip to China, and I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. 
I'm an attorney, and as an attorney, I'm an expert on humility. <laughs> By their very nature, news people are not humble, and news anchors are less humble, and Charlie is no exception. Charlie Gaddy is a man who has great humility, or has had hum humility, perhaps in the past, maybe 20 years ago. But tonight I'm going to tell you about a humble moment, a most humble moment in Charlie's life, which only I shared, something which the rest of you would not have heard about but for this evening, and it is my privilege to tell you this story. Three years ago, I was planning a trip to the Soviet Union, uh, excuse me, the People's Republic of China, and I was the international chairman of an organization known as Trout Unlimited. At that time, the honorary chairman of Trout Unlimited was Jimmy Carter. In order to plan the trip, I called Jimmy Carter's office, and never got to talk to Carter, but Carter's assistant said that he would send some letters on my behalf. Letters which said, we are members of the same organization, please extend the courtesy of, 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 a, good, of a good time and give, uh, give all due respect to Mr. Earnhardt. Well, these letters went out and I was very excited because I was going to study rivers in northern China and to work with, and work with Chinese officials. I told John Green about this, and I said, John, I'm going to be there for six or seven weeks, and it's going to be a terrific trip, and we'll see things that have never been seen by Westerners. We're going to oh, Manchuria, we're going to the area right along the Mongolian border, and he said, why don't I send Charlie Gaddy? We'll cover the remote areas that haven't been seen. This will be a great story. I was delighted, and as I said, I went for an extended period of time. I arrived in Beijing two weeks before Charlie. I was greeted by a 30-person delegation at the Beijing airport. There were flowers, there was a large reception line, and like Henry Kissinger, I did not have to go through customs. And I couldn't figure it out because I had sleeping bags, I had all kinds of gear, because I, and I knew something was wrong. Every English-speaking Chinese kept saying, Kata, Kata, Kata. He works for Kata which was not true. I had not met Jimmy Carter. But all of the Chinese said, please give my best to Carter. Well, a limousine was waiting outside, a long stretch Mercedes limousine. And they took me to a hotel with an entire entourage. I had an interpreter, I had an administrative assistant, and for two weeks, they took me everywhere I wanted to go. Well, I flew to Harbin, which is the old provincial capital of Manchuria, and that's where I was going to meet Charlie. Again, I was greeted at the airport by an entourage, and again, I had a limousine. Two days later, Charlie showed up at the hotel. Charlie and the cameraman and several others were in the back seat of a tiny white Isuzu station wagon, just beat all to pieces. They were, they were barely visible behind their camera equipment. Charlie basically just barely got out of the car. His back was killing him. He was just in a terrible mood. And within a very few minutes, the Chinese said, we must go to dinner now, Mr. Earnhardt. We must go to dinner. And I said, but Mr. Gaddy's just arrived. He said, who's Mr. Gaddy? A very famous American news person, an anchor person, very, very famous. That's all right. That's all right. We must go. My limousine pulled up and I said, Charlie, ride with me in the limousine. The Chinese pulled me aside and they said, does he know Jimmy Carter? <laughs> And I said, no, he doesn't. And they said, well, he cannot ride with you then. I got in my limousine. Charlie, again, in his whitey Suzu, packed in the back, followed me throughout Harbin for several days. And I was, I was most gracious about it. I would wave out the back window. Charlie would return gestures. On, on, on very, very hot days, I was even so kind as to roll down my window to let a little air conditioning drift back his way. In spite of this predicament, Charlie was he, was, he was determined to make friends with every Chinese person he knew, and he said, Tom, can you teach me some Chinese quickly, just a little Chinese? And I said, well, what do you want to know, Charlie? He said, um, I'm honored to meet you. And I said, that's Wo Hing Gao Xing Zhong Dao Ni. And Charlie said, no, 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 too complicated, something else. He said, hi, how are you? And I said, okay, well, hi, how are you is Ni Hao, Ni Hao. And Charlie said, ah, oh, I've got that. And you know, Charlie's from Bisco, and in Bisco, they speak Chinese with a southern drawl. And Charlie would say, ni hao, ni hao, which, I'm sorry to tell you, Charlie, translated in Chinese, was basically, screw you, screw you. <laughs> so so Charlie, Charlie would ride down in this tiny white Isuzu saying, screw you, screw you. And I, I tried to correct him, and it took two days, but in two days, Charlie finally speeded up his knee how to 
ni hao, ni hao. And Charlie was in the limousine. And I must say that within a very few days, just like he's done in the heart of Carolina, Charlie had won the hearts, minds, and, and the applause of thousands of Chinese. And it was an honor to be with him and an honor to be here tonight to recognize him. Happy birthday, Charlie. Charlie's travels had taken him many, many places. Nicaragua. It is my pleasure to introduce to you from the United States Army, Major Baxter Ennis. Well, first of all, folks, I've got to tell you, it wasn't Nicaragua, it was Honduras. But the problem was Nicaragua. Charlie, I bring you greetings from Fort Bragg, 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, we're all very proud of you and, and we appreciate the good work you do. Now, you just heard about Charlie's trip to China. Uh, and, you know, Charlie does get around the world an awful lot. Well, once in a while, he goes with us guys, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the active duty, and the reserves. And uh, I want to tell you about this particular trip that uh, Charlie and I shared. Uh, he did go down to Honduras. It was during Operation Golden Pheasant. And I don't know if you remember tonight, it was March of 1988. The Sandinistas from Nicaragua, several thousand of them, had uh, crossed the border into Honduras and were chasing the Contras and creating uh, quite an uproar. So President Bush decided to uh, draw a line in the jungle there and uh, sent some soldiers down there. And it was a very big news event. Media from around the world was there. So of course WRAL sent Charlie Gaddy to find out what was happening. Well, I first met Charlie on a remote mountain out in the Honduran countryside very far away from anything. I mean, there was nothing. You've probably seen some of the promos with Charlie standing in front of a Chinook helicopter. I think it even showed tonight there. Well, that was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it, was, it wasn't the end of the earth, but you could see it from there. And I just want to tell you that Charlie was the most recognizable guy there. Several thousand soldiers from the 82nd Airborne and from, uh, from other units were out there scattered in this dingy, nasty, God-forbidden place way in the boondocks of Honduras. But they saw this silver-haired fox walking to and fro when this cameraman... No, no, not fox. Like, I'm sorry, where's our... I'm, I'm sorry. No. They saw this silver-haired gentleman walking there and with the camera, the entourage there. And every one of them recognized him. He was the most recognized individual on those mountaintops. Now, we had colonels and we had generals, the commanding officers that were out there. Man, the troops didn't hardly recognize those guys. But they saw this white-haired, silver-haired fox walking out there. And he was immediately recognizable to every soldier out there. And as we walked along, there was a whole group of, of journalists and they were kind of broken into smaller groups and we walked around to the different positions to talk to the soldiers. And everywhere that Mr. Gaddy went, the soldiers recognized him. And, and some would say, hello, Charlie, how you doing? Or, or, hello, sir, how are you, how are you? And Charlie was just really, I, I don't want to tell you that the guy was soaking it up, but Charlie was soaking this up. He was out there, I mean, you know, it was like Mr big top cat on campus. He was walking and everybody knew him. Quite obvious, he was the top cat on the mountain. Well, one soldier finally put this all in perspective for, for Charlie here and, 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 and might have brought him down just a notch or two. Um, Charlie and, and his cameraman walked over to, to this one little fighting position. Actually, it was a little mortar crew, uh, three or four guys sitting there. And uh, this young soldier, I, he was probably from Troy or somewhere, somewhere down close to Bisco, and he, uh, he knew that this was a big dude, that there was white hair, he was very distinguished, very distinguished looking. Everybody was, was waving and standing up and acting important when, uh, when this guy came by. He knew somebody big was coming there. And he knew he knew who he was, and he jumped up there, and he just, you know, he's going to be like the spokesman for the group, and he says, Sir, I, I just want to tell you, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how how happy you've made us all by coming here to see us. And, and we just appreciate you taking time away from your show. And, and, and Mr. Donahue, we, we really, appreciate, <laughs> really appreciate you coming. Uh, Charlie, I do want to tell you in all sincerity that uh, the soldiers, and not only soldiers, but all of the military personnel and their families from around the North Carolina area, uh, we really appreciate what you do for us because you are our link with home. 
whether you are with us in Saudi Arabia or Honduras or wherever, um, you are still our link to our families. And you and the rest of the Channel 5 people uh, tell our families what we're doing and ship, show them pictures and images of, of what's happening. And uh, it really means a lot to them because the military life is a very unsettling, uh, volatile life. Charlie, we all appreciate what you do. And from all the men and women at Fort Bragg and all the military installations on North Carolina, we salute you and we thank you, sir. I guess that was the problem, Charlie. I was waiting for you in Nicaragua. <laughs> you flew into the Honduras. My pleasure now, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you, shh, Nancy, get a grip. <laughs> a man who is a legend in our state, who has forgotten more about North Carolina than most of us will ever learn. The North Carolina Secretary of State Retired, ladies and gentlemen, via videotape, Mr. Thad, your senior. Charlie who? <laughs> oh, Charlie Getty. I remember that fella. He used to be seeing at parties and entertain people. And then he moved into the television world. And I think that I recognize his voice now as I sit here in my golden years listening at the clock tick away time I wait and wait to hear Charlie come on there. Bless your heart Charlie. I believe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen the president of Methodist College Dr. Elton Hendricks. Some years ago, the Board of Trustees decided that it would be appropriate at Methodist College to invite Charlie Gaddy to come on the board because he was an active and involved Methodist and assigned me the task of approaching him. Well, I knew, as has been revealed here tonight, that Charlie had a great weakness for pretty faces. And knowing that I didn't qualify, I needed to find a pretty face. So I found the prettiest face that I could to approach Charlie Gaddy. And Vernon Tyson was successful in, <laughs> in encouraging Charlie Gaddy to come on the board, of, uh, the board of Trustees at Methodist. And he's been a very fine trustee. The first year that he was a trustee, a very interesting event happened. The development office at Methodist College got a letter from Charlie. It's usually the other way around. Charlie wrote the development office at Methodist and said, I've been on the board a few months and I'm certain that a mistake has occurred. I've been on the board a few months, and I haven't received the solicitation letter from you. Therefore, I'm sending you a check to correct what is obviously a deficiency on the part of the development office. Uh, this indicates, I think, the spirit and style that Charlie Gaddy has brought to his life and role as a trustee at Methodist College. It's the kind of thing that led a few years later for the board, to the Board of Trustees electing him as the chairman of the board. Charlie particip has participated in our graduation ceremonies and contributes a lot, although I have to confess he's the only graduation participant who has ever inquired if we had a teleprompter. Uh, the Charlie's uh, colleagues at, uh, on the evening news have pointed out that it's reassuring and comforting to them to be associated each evening with a person with, who has such respect and honor and integrity. And I have, as I have seen Charlie preside at board meetings at Methodist, I have also shared in that appreciation. Not long after he became the chairman of our board, someone observed that it was very useful to have a chairman who embodied the motto of the college, the motto which says truth and virtue. Someone is quipped about trustees that it is hoped by colleges that trustees provide wisdom, work, and wealth. 
We have benefited from Charlie's wisdom, and he has been involved with his work and his wealth. He presides well at our trustee board meetings, although I think it's a bit much when rather than taking a, a coffee break, we pause for a commercial. Uh, one of the great joys, of course, at Nuthis College and knowing Charlie is that it has provided those of us there with the opportunity to get to know Nancy, who is a woman of great wisdom and wit in her own right. And I suspect that it is her interest in dancing which she shares with Charlie, which explains why both of them at 60 years of age look so youthful and healthy. Congratulations and good luck to you. From CBS Evening News, by videotape, ladies and gentlemen, Charlie. Mr. Dan Rather. Oh, oh Charlie. And congratulations, congratulations on your birthday. No, oh, I'm not going to say which one. I will say that you and I are the same age. <laughs> Obviously, in your 20 years of news reporting, you've earned a lot of respect and friendship, including mine. Everybody here at CBS News has been thankful on more than one occasion to have the experience of you and your great news organization working for and with us. One mark of a good journalist, as we know, is how much he cares about the people he serves. And your work, Charlie, with the Cued Speech Center over a long period of time is a blue-perfect example of that. As your friends and colleagues gather together tonight, I want to extend personally and directly my thanks and a salute for a job well done. Happy birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United Way of Wake County, Mr. Ron J. Draco. My tribute is to Charlie Gaddy, the community volunteer. Charlie, on behalf of the United Way and the many agencies that we support, one of the most important being Cued Speech, we want to thank you for what has been your dedicated and tireless support of our agencies and our missions and good work over many years. I might just note that Charlie has always been there for all of our organizations, whether it might be to narrate a campaign video, to serve as a volunteer leader with Cued Speech and many, many other organizations, or to MC virtually countless fundraisers and special events. Charlie, we salute you and we thank you for what has been your commitment and your generosity. You have truly made a difference to the United Way and to many thousands of individuals in our community. I also, on a personal note, want to thank Charlie and also his dear wife, Nancy, for the rather formidable role that they have played in helping to um, mold my son, an adolescent, and I am sure many other teenagers, uh, many of them, I am certain, the sons and daughters of you in this audience. For those of you who may not know what I'm speaking of, Nancy for many years has run the Junior Cotillion of Raleigh and has done just a fantastic job in taking our snot-nosed kids and trying to give them some of the social graces. And I can uh, assure you, we've already heard Charlie singing and much about his dancing ability. I can assure you that the highlight of the uh, year for the Cotillion is the spring ball and nothing is more impressive than, first of all, to see them chaperone these 400 teenagers, and secondly, to get out there and lead every dance, those obscure dances, remember them? The waltz, the foxtrot, the cha-cha. They do a great job, uh, and I can uh, tell you from having seen it myself, Charlie can really cut a rug. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great honor to introduce the next gentleman. I've had the occasion to have been frisked by him before. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can't go home again, you know this. Sheriff John Baker.
Juanita and I want to take this opportunity to say happy birthday to you. Charlie Gaddy and John Baker Sr. were very close friends. And I met Charlie through my daddy. And he and I have been close friends ever since. The last couple of weeks, uh, I've had any number of telephone calls from your friends. It says, Sheriff, I understand that you're going to be at the great celebration for Charlie Gaddy. Yes, I wouldn't miss it. Will you please arrest Charlie Gaddy? I guess, Charlie, I received about uh, 200 of those calls. <laughs> and a couple of them, I asked him, I said, if I'm going to arrest him, what should I bring? Now, I know what to bring when I go to arrest an individual. He said, sure, if you'll be smart, if you bring the handcuffs, if you bring the leg cuffs, and if you bring the nine millimeter, because he's subject to give you great trouble. Charlie, I don't have any of those tonight, but what I am going to do is make you a deputy sheriff so you can go and arrest all your friends yourself. <laughs> and also, to, since I'm going to bestow the honor of a deputy sheriff on you, I'm going to give you the paracentric key that will unlock the jail cells in the old jail because I'm sure you want to place your friends in the old jail. So this plaque reads, Charlie Gaddy, Deputy Sheriff, with grateful appreciation for your years of honest, informative, and accurate news reporting for the citizens of Wake County. John H. Baker, Jr., Sheriff of Wake County, September the 15th. And this is a memento of the new public safety center, which is a paracentric key. Congratulations and happy birthday to you and your wife. You have the key. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the United States Congress, this evening certainly would not be complete without hearing from this gentleman. Via videotape, Senator Jesse A. Helms. Hi, everybody. You know, words project images. And when I learned that Charlie Gaddy was to be roasted at this dinner, I had an image of Charlie on a spit with an apple in his mouth being slowly turned over hot, glowing embers. Now, I banished that image from my mind. They wouldn't do that to a nice guy who has been steadily nudging Walter Cronkite away from center stage. Dan Rather has already fallen off the side of the stage, the left side. In any case, I hope that I don't ruin Charlie Gaddy's image with the confession I'm about to make. But I had a little something to do with Charlie's moving from WPTF radio to WRL television. That was before I lost my mind and ran for the Senate in 1972. Charlie had become a legend in his time at WPTF principally because of his highly successful program, Ask Your Neighbor. Now, being the brilliant judge of broadcast programming, I figured Charlie and his legend could be transferred easily from radio to television. In any case, after some discussion and negotiation, Charlie agreed to come. We put Ask Your Neighbor on television, and when the first rating came in, Charlie's television version of Ask Your Neighbor had a rating of two, two people, Charlie's wife, Nancy, and the director of Channel 5's control booth. Now, after making that brilliant decision, I had no alternative. I had to run for the Senate. That was my escape hatch, and anyhow, that decision had proved that I was qualified to be a United States Senator. <laughs> then the station decided to try Charlie as anchorman for Channel 5's evening news, and as Paul Harvey says, now you know the rest of the story. Charlie Gaddy is one of the most decent, most personable guys I've ever known. 
He's a critic to broadcast journalism. I don't know how many homes are in Channel 5's coverage area, but Charlie's name is a household word in every one of them. Until the day that Jack Benny died, he always claimed to be just 39 years old. He stopped having birthdays when he reached 39 and would have an anniversary of his 39th birthday every year thereafter. Otherwise, he said, he would wake up one morning and find out that he was an old man. And Charlie Gaddy learned about that, which is why he is this year celebrating the, the 21st anniversary of his 39th birthday. And that's why this year I am celebrating the 31st anniversary of my 39th. Dot Helms, my best friend and roommate for nearly 49 years, is enormously grateful to Charlie Gaddy for his unfailing support of the Cued Speech Center, and so am I. Dot and I would have liked so very much to be on hand in person this evening, but circumstances made that impossible. So we send our affectionate best wishes to Mary Elsie and to all the other folks who work with her in carrying out the noble purposes of the Cued Speech Center. God bless you, Charlie Gaddy, and God bless all of you who support the Cued Speech Center. One of the highlights of my evening tonight has been to stand up here and listen to uh, Commissioner of Agriculture Jim Graham and Avery Upchurch sit together. <laughs> They're speaking a foreign language. Commissioner said, uh, <laughs> And Avery said, Commissioner, I strain to hear this conversation. Jim said, <laughs> Avery went, <laughs> I said, this is high politics going on here. This is stuff I don't understand. We're in the presence of great truths here tonight. You're about to hear Avery Upchurch read a proclamation. This is a treat, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you who have studied French, German, Scandinavian, whatever, help us to understand what this man is saying. We have the signers. Thank God. <laughs> it is my pleasure and privilege to present a very good friend of the arts and a wonderful mayor who has done an awful lot for Raleigh. I love Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Avery C. Upchurch. Nancy and Charlie, <laughs> I'm pleased to be here and to share the roast with you tonight. I think I just was roasted. I just got roasted. I mean, I can feel the heat. Uh, <laughs> I am here tonight, Charlie and Nancy, to honor you as the mayor of the city of Raleigh and wish you well and happy birthday. I do appreciate the opportunity that they've given me to speak for an entire minute to say whatever I please about you, Charlie. You know, allowing me this opportunity is only fair because Charlie for years and years has been saying whatever he wanted to about the city council and me. And it didn't seem to bother him, you know, he just keeps saying it on and on and on. But as a public servant in Raleigh, uh, we know that there is no greater honor we can achieve than being misquoted by such an icon in broadcasting industry as Charlie Gaddy. 
Perhaps his ears aren't what they used to be. Sometimes what I say is not just what you heard me say, Johnny. That's why I think it's particularly appropriate that the proceeds from this tribute will go to the Benefit Cube Speech Center. You see, Charlie has been giving Cube speeches for years. <laughs> you know, we, we go back a long ways, too. I can, I can remember when our hair was a darker gray. Or maybe we were blonde or something like that. But putting all kidding aside, while he doesn't always say about us what we want him to, he is always fair and treats everyone with respect. It would be impossible to describe Charlie Gaddy without mentioning words like integrity, honesty, and professionalism. On this special occasion of your 60th birthday, we at the city and the entire city of Raleigh wishes you many more years of well-earned success. Now, one of the authorities or privileges bestowed upon a mayor is that they may issue proclamations, and proclamations mean a great deal to me and to the city council and to all the people of Raleigh, I'm sure. And this is a most outstanding and a most deserved proclamation. Uh, Ira, are you listening now? I want to make sure Ira understands what I'm reading. <laughs> yeah, I think he left, Charlie. Proclamation. Whereas Charlie Gaddy has been a constant in Raleigh broadcasting for more than 30 years. Whereas Charlie Gaddy has covered news events of local and national importance and has won numerous awards for broadcast excellence, including an Irish award, two United Press International Awards for radio documentaries, and the 1984 Radio Television News Directors Association of the Carolinas Best Documentary Award. And whereas Charlie Gaddy has been tireless in the field of community affairs, serving the Board of Directors of the Cube Speech Center, as Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Methodist College, Alumni Board President of Guilford College, and as a pro and insp inspirational public speaker, and whereas the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, is a brighter, a friendlier, and a better informed place because of Charlie Gaddy. Now, therefore, do I, Avery C. Up Church, the mayor of the city, hereby proclaims Charlie Gaddy Week to be observed September the 15th through the 21st, 1991. Signed this 15th day of September, 1991, Avery of Church Mayor. Let me present this to you this time, Charlie. Congratulations and thank you so very much. We have now reached the celebration point of the program tonight where we're going to present Charlie with a few birthday surprises. You've all been very wonderful and patient. I'd like to present you, Charlie, with a, uh, a present now from uh, Dwayne Powell of the News and Observer. Can open it. Once Dwayne has had you, Charlie, it means you're famous. This is what you see on your programs tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a... Dwayne, are you here? No. He's not here, Charlie. <laughs> Sit down, Charlie. <laughs> also tonight, we have a presentation from the Secretary of State, Rufus Edmondson. It is presented to you, Charlie, tonight by his representative, Mr. Jonathan Demers. John? I'm here. <laughs> First, I want to say I've, I've known Charlie Gaddy and Nancy Gaddy for 20 years, and I am a product of the Raleigh Junior Cotillion. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, on behalf of the Secretary of State of the State of North Carolina, Rufus L. Edmiston recognizes Charlie Gaddy, a distinguished journalist and friend with special gratitude for many years of unselfish devotion to the Cued Speech Center on this momentous occasion of having reached his 60th birthday, still being sound of mind, full of life, 
and possessing a delightful spirit that warms the hearts of all his friends and admirers, do hereby proclaim Charlie Gaddy to be not getting older, but getting better, and do hereby confer upon him the absolute right to lie about his age, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and affixed my seal, done in office at Raleigh this 15th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1991. Rufus L. Edmiston, Secretary of State of North Carolina. Happy birthday, Charlie. Uh, now, some of you have been um, aware that we had a silent auction, and we're going to announce the winners of that silent auction in a moment. But first, I would like to present a very special uh, presentation tonight. It will be done by Mr. Ben Alexander, an auctioneer, who is going to auction off a painting by Mr. Gaddy. Uh, Charlie is a man of many talents. Some of you may not know he, uh, he is an artist. And uh, so tonight we're going to turn it over to Ben Alexander who's going to show us a little side of Charlie that perhaps we don't know. Ben? Charlie. Charlie, um, I was in the acute speech center and everyone was excited because an anonymous art collector had presented the acute speech center with this Charles Godet painting. <laughs> Now, they were all excited, and they said, Ben, you're an auctioneer. Would you auction this thing off for us? And I said, well, uh, any auctioneer that's worth his salt is going to be careful with paintings. So many of them have been forged for these great painters. And uh, I said, I'll have to do some research on it before I can agree to do this. And I checked around, and I found out that down at Red's Pure Oil Station in Bisco, there was a guy that helps down there some that is an expert on Chevrolets and Godets. And I figured it was worth a trip to check this thing out before I put my reputation up and auctioned off this painting. He said it is an original Charles Godet. He also said that we could enhance it a little bit if we'd wipe it down with his dipstick rag. <laughs> it would bring out the colors. And he said that if you job the frame, uh, it would make it kind of look like wormy chestnut, and that would enhance it also. But I figure that people, whoever buys this thing tonight, I'm, I, they, <laughs> they deserve it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is your opportunity to own an original good day. I, uh, I put my word, my honor behind it. It is, has been checked out. It's authentic. It was painted uh, in the era. Is that cubism? What is that? What do you call that, Charlie? That's, uh, that's two martinis. Two martinis, yeah. <laughs> my friend down at the red the station, he said that he thought the name of it was Coats of Many Colors. He said there were a lot of coats of paint there and there's many colors. But uh, you don't have a name for it, Charlie? Well, let's sell it. All right, now, what am I bid? Who's going to give me a bid? How about a bid? I need, how about a $25 bid? I need a bid here on this painting. Come on now. How about a $25 bid? <laughs> have we got a $25 bid? I've got a $25 bid now. Who will make it $50? $50 bid? Who will give me $50? $50. This can replace the CBSI. Come on now. Who will give me $50? <laughs> I want a $50 bid. I want a $50 bid. I got $25. We bid $50. $50 bid. Hey, somebody back here in the back. Come on, let's have $50. How about a $50 bid? I want a $50 bid. Jim's stuck with you. <laughs> Jim. <laughs> you, you, 25. 
I'll take it. I'll take anything I can get. Thirty. <laughs> Thirty. The man told me, by the way, uh, this goes to the cued speech, and you can deduct the whole thing on you know, your income tax. <laughs> so this is a real. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by that, but that's what he told me. Anyway, all right. We have a thirty dollar bid now. Who'll make it thirty five? Who'll make it thirty five? I've got a thirty five dollar bid. I want a thirty five dollar bid. We bid thirty five. Got thirty five now. Forty. Who'll make it forty? Forty. Got forty dollars. Who'll make it forty five? I want forty five. We'll bid a forty five. How about a forty-five dollar bid? Uh, foreign lust don't go. Don't. I got forty-five. How about a fifty dollar bid? Fifty dollar. Fifty dollar bid. I got a fifty dollar bid. Now who will make it fifty-five? Fifty-five. Who will give me fifty-five? We need bid fifty-five dollars. How about a fifty-five dollar bid? All right, will it bid? What are you going to pay for it today? Hey, how about it? Fifty-five. Give me a fifty-five dollar bid. How about a fifty-five dollar bid? I got fifty dollars in the center here. I've got fifty dollars. Who's going to make it fifty-five? I've got 55, who'll make it 60? Who'll make it $60? <laughs> oh, love that just raised the price. It was touched by the painter himself. All right, now who'll make it 60? I've got 55, who'll make, I got $60, who'll make it 65? How about 60, I got 65, now 70, I want 70. I've got $70, now who'll make it 75? How about $75? I need a $75 bid. I've got $70, how about, a, I've got $75. Now, how about, $80, $80 bid. Touch it one more time, Charlie. I've got $80. I got $80 bid now. Who will make it 85? 85, I need an $85 bid. All right, now I've got $80. How about an $85 bid? $85, $85. I've got $80 once. How about an $85 bid? I've got an $85 bid now, 90. We'll make it $90. $90, we'll make a $90 bid. I've got 85 now, $90. We'll bid 90, I got $90. 95, 95, who'll we'll make it 95, I got 95. I want a C note. How about a $100 bid? $100, I got a $100 bid now, 105. 105. Uh, have I got 105 in the back? How about 105? Hey, have we got 105? I've got a hundred dollar bid. I've got a hundred and five. How about a hundred and ten? A hundred and ten. How about a hundred and ten dollars? We only bid a hundred and ten. A hundred and ten. A hundred and ten dollars. I need a hundred and ten dollars. Will you give me a hundred and ten? Uh, sure. We'll give me a hundred and ten for a good day. Touch it one more time, Charlie, please. Come on. <laughs> I've got, I guess I got a, I got a hundred and ten. How about a hundred and ten? I've got a hundred and five now, right? How about a hundred and ten? We'll give me a hundred and ten. I need a hundred and ten. <laughs> oh me! A hey, hey, double autograph it. <laughs> All right, now I, I, I got 110, 110 right here. 110. How about 115? 115. Uh, you need it for the station. 115. <laughs> 110. I've got 110. I've got 110. Who? We got 110 now, how about 115? Will you bid 115? I need 115. What will you bid? How about 115? I have $110 here. I got $110 going once. I've got $110. Anybody going? All bids in? I've got $110 twice. And it's sold for $110 to the lady right here. Yeah. Ben, thank you so very much. I'd like to call a lady up to the uh, podium now. This is the lady who uh, rooked me into this and who said it was Nicaragua. <laughs> She's going to help me uh, announce the prizes for the silent auction. She's a lady who's done so much for the Cute Speech Center. It's a pleasure to know her and also to have worked on stage with her daughter, Leah. She's a wonderful actress and who brought a very important message to a lot of people in our theater. And I even got to learn some signs myself. And I love them both very much, too. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Elsie Davy. Now you announce them. You read these names. Okay, the winners of the silent auction. We'll do this quickly, and you can pick up your prizes at the end of the program from the ladies over there in the corner. The winner of the exercise bike, David's pretty dirty. He couldn't read the names. <clears throat> Nadina Whitney. 
Neji. Okay. The winner of the um, gold ring from Aura Designers Fine Jewelers is Graham Parker. The winner of the gold loop earrings from Aura Designers Fine Jewelers is Dennis Franklin. Yeah. We need to say here too that Aura Designers Fine Jewelers is one of Nancy's favorite jewelers and Charlie's so happy that we're giving these prizes away it means there's less jewelry Nancy can buy. <laughs> Good. The pink ice ring from Touch of Gold is won by Minnie Stone. The Triangle Dining, which was a hot bargain, they're usually sold for $30, and since the year is drawing to a close, um, I think it's B.F. Whitney. So enjoy your prizes. Charlie, as we draw to the close of tonight's festivities, which you have weathered very well, I've got to tell you, big guy, We'd like to present you with um, an album of letters. These letters have been sent by Charlie's friends and admirers. And it's presented to you by the chairman of the Cude Speech Center Board of Directors and co-chairman of this event, Mr. Ed Jennings. Charlie, there's probably no greater word than we have heard so many times tonight, and that is love. Obviously, you are one of the more loved and admired people in this state. And I just want to tell you that the people who are involved with cued speech and who are involved with trying to help those who are hearing impaired have a very special love for you, and we thank you for your love for them, and it's with gratitude we present this to you. Now we also have some door prizes for all of you folks who've come and you've been here tonight and uh, we want to award you with some prizes too for your endurance this evening. We have some door prizes uh, beginning with a dinner at the Angus Barn. Now the winner and guest will dine with the Gaddies. You'll be transported in a limousine and plied with champagne. So we're going to ask uh, Nancy, I'm going to ask you to draw the name. And the winner is Charlie Gaddy. I'm sorry. No, it's another Charlie. Charlie Day. You bought the painting too? Oh my God. Charlie. Okay, Charlie. Go see Mary Elsie Davy right back here. There she is. She's going to make you the presentation. You ever had champagne with Charlie? It's a treat. Okay. One glass and he's out. Now, second prize. Earrings. Charlie gave me a pair. They're very beautiful. <laughs> shh, Nancy. Shh. Earrings from Aura Jewelers. These are 14 karat gold shell earrings, like the ones I wore tonight before I came on. In your program, six door prizes were listed, but it was decided to enter two other pieces of valuable jewelry given by Aura Jewelers and a ring given by Touch of Gold Jewelers in the silent auction. This is to raise more money for the Cute Speed Center. So Charlie, we're going to ask you to do the honors for the earrings. They're not for me. You're in a lot of trouble. Okay. R. Graham Parker.
Here, our big guy. We have a matching brummet for their generosity. Uh, jewelry is Nancy's weakness. And this is one of Nancy's favorite jewelry stores. And we know Charlie is glad, as we said, to have given so much, to, that, that they've given so much to this event because Nancy won't be able to buy what we're giving away here. <laughs> now we have dinner for, uh, dinner, is this for two? However many? They can take 50, 60 people? Shut up, Mary Elsie. We're on a roll here. This is dinner at 42nd Street Oyster Bar Speech Center. It's presented by Mary Elsie Davy, Daisy and her daughter, Leah Lewis. Leah? It's a very special gift from all the people collected with the Crispy Center, the staff, the board of directors, the volunteers, the friends and supporters. We all love you. One thing I learned working with Leah was this sign, joined together. This is what we have been tonight. Thank you all so much for coming to celebrate a man who is in many respects a legend. There are very few of them. And we do love you, Charlie. You come into our living rooms. You talk to us each evening. You bring us the news from the world, which is sometimes disturbing. But because you bring it to us, there is a feeling of uh, strength and courage and reinforcement. And we love you for it. You are indeed a part of our lives. And sometimes we take those parts of our lives for granted. Tonight we have an opportunity to tell one of those people how much he does mean to us, how much he will continue to mean to us. And we celebrate you tonight, Charlie. We celebrate you and Nancy, both of you. We love you so much. We're so glad you made the decision to be here, to be a part of this family. And we will love, cherish, and remember you for years to come. God bless you both. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a birthday party wouldn't be complete without a birthday cake. Joyce, All everybody. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Charlie. Happy birthday to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're going to have some dance music here in a moment. So those of you who don't have to dash and run away, we hope you'll stay with us for a while. We're going to cut the cake. Charlie, you're lucky they only put two candles on this. This was great. We had the fire department standing by in case we had all the candles. As any birthday party, we should have a a dance of honor. And as I have said, a lot of women have told me that you don't dance with anybody until you dance with Charlie Getty. So I think to start the dance off tonight and to bring us into the part of the program where you can visit with Charlie, you can visit with your friends, Nancy, Charlie, would you do us the honor of 
starting the dance together tonight. We love you so much. This is your dance. Join them when you will. Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy and Charlie Getty. We love them very, very much. God bless you. Anticipation is everything. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie and Nancy Gaddy.